Welcome to Divorce TV. I'm your host, Wally Marcus. Our topic today is a conversation with a divorce fi financial planner. My guest is David Hammer. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Wally. Good pleasure to have you. Pleasure uh, to be here. We always have fun talking before the show starts, and so I've learned all sorts of things, including that you're from West Virginia. But why don't you add on that and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, I, am a, I have my, a financial planning practice here in Tucson. I'm a certified financial planner and a certified divorce financial analyst. Uh, and I am also a member of the Collaborative Law Group of Southern Arizona. Remember I told you I'd ask the questions that would pop into my head? Sure. Why did you become a, uh, do, start doing the Collaborative? That was a, we talked about that a little bit beforehand, sure. and that was an interesting answer. Well, and I, I, I knew an attorney here in town, and I saw a reference to her and Collaborative Divorce, and it just talked a little bit about what Collaborative Divorce was all about, and I was curious. So I went and met with her, and I came home and told my wife that I, I had to be involved with this because it was so consistent with who I am and, and my ideas of how conflicts should be resolved. So I just went from there. At the time, I really didn't care whether I ever did any divorces or not. It just was intriguing to me, and, and it's just gone from yeah, there. Yeah, I had similar, similar feelings on that one. But what actually does a financial planner do? Well, a financial planner in a planner, divorce, in a divorce <laughs> we do lots of other things as well. But in a divorce, as you can imagine, all, all the different emotions that might be involved in a divorce and, and what the divorce financial analyst does is really translate those to the financial issues. So um, a lot of times one of the parties might not be familiar with the financial issues, there may be distrust, there may be all those other things that can happen in a divorce situation and they translate to the, to the couple's financial resources. And so that's where we come in and really deal with all those issues as they relate to the financial. So and is, is your role in the divorce one representing one party, the other party neutral. What's your? It can be either, and it really depends on what type of divorce the couple is pursuing. In a collaborative divorce, uh, the financial analyst is a neutral, working for the process, working for both parties, providing information. In a mediation, it can be either, and if it's a uh, an adversarial divorce, typically the financial analyst is working for one party or the other. Okay. The training, specific training for this? Training is, uh, there is a, uh, a program for certified divorce financial analysts, uh, which I've completed, and there are a number of us here in town. And uh, also, as far as the collaborative group is concerned, there's separate training for collaboration. A lot of financial analysts will also go through mediation training, which I have not, but it's also I recommend helpful. it. Yeah. Uh, it's, a it's lot a good, of people have. It, it, it's, it's, it's a good life, good life training Absolutely, as well. Yeah. What about cost? The cost is, uh, and again, it depends on the type of divorce that uh, the couple is pursuing. Uh, in, in collaborative and mediation, typically they would pay me directly as opposed to. Let me just because I, sure. uh, we've done shows and we've had you know your good our good friend read on that. Cost is a big concern. Yeah, well, not just cost, but I'm not sure people understand the difference when I realize between collaborative mediation and we're sort of using those terms. But if you can give a ten word uh, definition, so people who haven't seen our shows and we've done shows on collaborative, of course, what, what is collaborative versus mediation versus adversary uh, in I'll, ten words or less? I'll try. To <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it as simple as I can. Collaborative is is a process where. Uh, Really, the couple comes together. They're each represented by an attorney. Uh, sometimes a mental health professional is involved as a coach, a, a neutral financial analyst. And the idea is there that uh, each party is really working as part of the process. It's probably the, the process that allows for the most give and take. And everybody talks to everybody. Uh, mediation is a situation where... How does collaborative differ from a friendly adversary divorce? Uh, is there such a thing? As sure. A <laughs> yeah, yes, there are. Yes, I, I have done that. Um, and I've had mean mediations and good, that it depends on who the people are. And it, it, may not, it may not differ significantly in terms of that cooperation aspect, which is very, very important because that gives you the opportunity to explore a lot more options, uh, come up with perhaps some creative ideas that you might not typically have available. Um, so in some ways it may be similar, but the difference is, the involvement of the financial person as a neutral uh, is, is fairly unique. And also the idea that there may be some mental health professionals involved as coaches. And they're not there for therapy. They are there to help people communicate through the process. So that's collaboration. That's a collaborative divorce. Mediation is uh, when there is a mediator, uh, such as yourself. And uh, they are there to help the two parties come to an agreement. They're not necessarily there to tell them what to do, uh, but they're there to help them come to an agreement themselves. And as I said, in that case, the financial analyst may be working for 
the process for both parties or could be working for one of the other parties if they chose. Uh, in an adversarial divorce, the most typical uh, role for a financial analyst is, is to be involved as support for one of the party's attorneys. And uh, so they provide information, they provide analysis, and then it, it goes from there. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what the divorce financial planner does during a, a divorce? I mean, you've alluded to some of the things sure. in general terms. Well, and it, it's, a, it, it, it's everything from helping with budgeting, uh, identifying assets, uh, cataloging assets, doing scenarios for spousal maintenance and child support, for example, um, dealing with issues of liquidity. Are some of the financial resources more liquid than others? In other words, can they be converted to cash more easily than others? Why would they, they want to, to uh, convert to cash? Or why well, they, I mean, you, you mentioned that a few times. I, sure. had, I haven't given a lot of thought to that, but I can... Well, in, in simple terms, if, if you take a, a divorce situation where the conclusion is we're just going to take everything and split it in half, uh, you may have real estate, you may have other kind, you may have interest, business interest. Uh, there may be other things that are more difficult to convert to cash than others. And so when you're looking at a couple's financial situation, uh, if the idea is to leave them both in a certain position as far as total assets are concerned, some of them may be more easily convertible to cash than others. Some of them may have more risk or not, or less associated with them if they were to hold them for the future. So it's those kinds of trade-offs that a financial analyst can work with the couple beyond just the raw numbers. What happens when you have a situation where you're one person, and I've seen this a lot, I mean, fairly sophisticated financially, and mm -hmm. not unusual, that one party does all of that and the other party is like... Very common. And so you're having a situation where you're, you know, I mean, you sort of have to gear the conversation. I mean... To two different levels. It's it's part of it, and personally. Let me sure. The, the second part of the question is actually when do you, how do you communicate with them? Well, and and, and personally, I, I I prefer to uh, make clear to the couple that it's worthwhile. It's to both. It's in, it's in both of their best interest that each of them have all the information they need to make a decision and come to an agreement. Uh, it really benefits them both. It benefits the person, obviously, who is less familiar with financial issues, but it also benefits the other person because they're going to leave this divorce knowing that that agreement was made under the best possible circumstances. It would also seem to me in some ways that you saying it may be more, have more credibility than the, the spouse other spouse said. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So and and d distrust is always an issue. One of the common questions you get, of course, is what about, oh, so-and-so's been hiding assets, and I don't trust this, and I don't trust that. And uh, one, one good way to, to, pers to look at that, frankly, is to look at tax returns. Tax, yeah. re tax returns is where everything shows up. Well, I had to tell you, I was in a meeting, a bar association meeting once. I love that in the situation. And that people said to them, you know, how many times have people gotten tax returns? Raise your hand. How many have you actually gotten copies from the government? So many people raised their hand. Did you compare the tax returns? And there was an amazing number that were filed returns versus, you know, and doing that one. Yeah. Although I got to tell you, my favorite story in terms of uh, asset disclosure was I had a, a mediation case I did years ago where the fellow hid some of the assets. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the wife reopened the case. This is my, my reason for doing that one. And this is a guy who worked on Wall Street, and he'd gotten a $20 million bonus that year, which would have been off the table. Right. But when she reopened it, it was back Came on the back. table. And him trying to hide two or three, what was it, a few hundred thousand dollars in assets cost him $10 million. Well, and it's... <laughs> and it, I, I use that story all the time in mediation to say, you don't want to do this. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great example. And I, uh, one of my favorite movies is War of the Roses, which okay. I'm sure you're familiar yeah, absolutely. with. Absolutely. was just on TV a little while ago. And, and the obvious example, similar to yours, is uh, you're a, a penny penny short and a pound foolish, or whatever, whatever yeah. the case may be, is you get hung up on these trivial details which really get in the way of the bigger picture and, and actually can end up costing people a, a lot, lot of money. more. I know. Absolutely. It is crazy stuff. To say nothing of the cost involved for the professionals involved. I was a few times I was called as a witness in a case, too. Uh, we've been talking a lot about process, but a little talk about a little, some of the realities of sure. it. What is the financial impact of, on a couple getting a divorce? It can be all over the map, and, and as you can imagine, uh, we, we talk a lot about just the size of the pie, and uh, is, the si is the pie large enough to support each of those people separately? Obviously, it's more expensive for two people to live I, I've always told together. people, I've always said it's like a third, one third, I'm, I'm not sure even where I got the number from, a third, one third more expensive to live separately. That's, than th that's, that's, a, that's a good rule of thumb, because I think a lot of people don't realize that. I think a lot of people think that they will be able to 
maintain their lifestyle, both of them maintain their lifestyle without having to make any adjustments. And so that's another thing that the financial analyst can do, which is talk about the available size, of the, the size of the available pie, how that might work for both parties, and really to try to, in a diplomatic way, uh, a, a, a neutral way, an objective way, make sure they understand that they will both probably have to make some adjustments, even for people with a lot of resources. They almost always have to make some adjustments. I would assume, though, that part of the, what you're able to do is to also make the pie a little, not a lot bigger, but a little bit bigger. Um, I mean, there's certainly some things that you can recommend. It's, it's how you use the pie, uh, perhaps, and, and, and unfortunately, part of our other speech is financial analysis. Once we reach an agreement, obviously everybody here hopes that both of you make sound financial decisions going forward and everything works out for you, but we just have to trust that once we reach a decision and this thing is settled, uh, that that's going to happen in the future, and, and we can't be overly concerned with that. This is one of these I think, unfortunate things. I think a lot of people are concerned about the cost of these things, but Absolutely. really you could end up saving people. You pay for yourself, really. Well, in, in some ways. And, 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 and if people make decisions without having the kind of information that a financial professional can provide, it can come back to bite them later. Uh, oh, I thought keeping the house would be a great idea. I had, I, I had no idea that it would involve X, Y, and Z. And so if you have the opportunity to have someone working with you with those things, and I'm, you know, I'm not a real estate professional, I'm not an attorney, but to just to ask the questions and so that, so that everybody can, can start thinking about what it really means um, in terms of the financial. I'm going to come back to the houses later on. That's sure. an issue which I think has yeah. changed, in, at least within my it divorce career, is. where you know, people kept saying, gee, the equity is going to increase, increase, yeah. and now there's a decrease. It's a whole different de pattern. The one thing I constantly hear, Okay, from the the husband or the wife, the other person's gonna male women do better, men do better. Do you have any sense of no, you know, no, of, I, I, of, of I, whether I, that is I, the, actually the case? I mean, they both feel that way, and maybe it's because they're both, you know, the one third expenses, and so they're both sure. The, well, and part of that is the the mythical friend. Everybody has a friend who went through a divorce. <laughs> my friend did this, and my friend did that, and we just want to take that friend and string them up because it's it's really not productive. Every case. Every situation is obviously unique. Uh, I'm not sure I could really say that men or women fare better in divorce necessarily. I think, again, they both have to make adjustments going forward. And sometimes, and, and, and I don't think you can make a generalization, but some people are just more capable of making those adjustments than others. They're more comfortable with change. They're more adaptable. Uh, and I think that's a big part of it. You keep reminding me of cases I've gone through and anecdotes, and I still the one I love is the lady who came in and said I want one hundred thousand dollars a year in alimony. I said why? She said that's what my neighbor got, and she started flipping out the agreement. You know what's the neighbor's income? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but that's that's fairly classic in divorce. Absolutely. This is funny. I mean, we both have a lot of war stories that way. What are the, the the sort of the mistakes that a lot of people make? Financial mistakes that people make when they're getting a divorce. I, I think a lot of people get wed to certain assets. They get think wed to the they, they, they get A little double meaning there. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, no pun intended. But they really come in with a, with a, with a preconception, if you will, uh, about whether it's from the friend or their own ideas about how this might work. And uh, sometimes that gets in the way. So I think that's a problem. I think if you go in with a clean slate, if you're able to trust the professionals you're working with, your attorney, the financial professional, uh, it, it's much, much more helpful. What about, I mean, is there certain things that people do that you think that are just, I mean, I'm sorry, you know, they uh, cancel health insurance, do something which is going to be a sort of, a, you see as a pattern where they do, or they're just everybody's, each case we, is a little we, bit unique. I, I don't often see that. I think people typically are, are savvy enough not to make rash decisions in anticipation of something happening, because, of course, as soon as you anticipate something happening, it's not, or the opposite. Or the happens. hiding of assets. I guess but you're still I mean, that's probably... I the think, hi well, and, and ultimately, if, if someone has really been orchestrating something over a long number of years, uh, it, it may be that people could hide assets. But in mo I haven't really seen it. I've never I really mean, experienced that. You're not, I mean, you're really a forensic person. Yeah, I'm not a forensic account. But does that come, I mean, do you get more involved also in the hidden assets at all? Or does that come up? Uh, we have... In one case, had to refer people, a couple, to a forensic accountant just to get everything resolved because there were some fairly complex issues. But in terms of addressing specific questions, uh, yes, we do get involved with that. What about the value of this? Um, what about 
the long-term prospects for this. Where did this money go? Uh, where did that bonus go? It may not be twenty million dollars. What do you? I mean, how do you? Well, you're doing that in a collaborative case. Are you able to do that without appearing to take sides? Absolutely, because and how do you do that? Everybody, everybody in the collaborative process is reinforcing that answering those questions is to everybody's benefit. And if I'm the person that received the bonus, I actually we impress upon the person that received the bonus that it's to their benefit that they're soon-to-be ex-spouse, understands what happened there because they're going to be more comfortable with the agreement. They're going to be less likely to get hung up on details. They start to build that level of understanding so that it's actually in everybody's best uh, interest. I'll ask you a question sort of based on an experience I had where somebody, you get a mortgage application, you see it, and all of a sudden they're declaring assets which they haven't disclosed. I mean, I've seen that happen. Yeah. Where they haven't shown any place. And all of a sudden you, you've discovered... You know, that they own a house in New Hampshire. Yeah. yeah. And, and I haven't personally had that happen, but uh, in those cases, you just have to, well, first of all, collaborative is a full disclosure process. And if people aren't willing to fully disclose, then it doesn't work. In fact, we will, the professionals will resign and they have to start from scratch. Uh, in mediation, you, you may have some opportunity to impress upon people how important that is. Um, in an adversarial divorce, uh, I, I think you have less opportunity to do that, obviously, working with your team. We were talking earlier a little bit about houses. and mm -hmm. a lot of, I mean, the, the, I think the underwater statistics are huge huge at this point. So how do you, I mean, that's, that's the, it seems to me the issue that keeps coming up, I'm seeing in the cases I'm handling and my colleagues are handling, is what do you do when the house is under, underwater? When the house is underwater and, and, and You get the right answer and this can be a rich man. <laughs> Wouldn't I, though? Uh, First of all, I, I think it's important to consider wrapping everything up when the, when the divorce is done, which would argue for, for resolving the house. Either somebody's going to keep it or we're going to sell it and we'll each share equally in the, the penalty, if you will, whatever the penalty that might be, uh, whether it's a financial penalty or a hit to our credit report or whatever, uh, that we would share equally in that, the same as we would share equally if there were equity in the house and we were to sell it. It, it does get trickier, and especially if there are children involved, you're always going to be parents, and so you, you, you will be in situations where you have to work together as far as the children are concerned. Why create another situation which could be um, a distraction, could be an irritant for that ongoing relationship, which is we both still own this house. So if there are ways to resolve that underwater house, uh, it's, it's a generally a good idea and that may include if you come up with any short, novel do, uh, there are no there are no novel ideas i mean the short sales uh the other kind of things that may be involved if one of the party ends up keeping the house then they get credit if you will when we do our accounting for the fact that they've taken on uh that negative equity i mean it seems to me a lot of people want to stay in the house for the kids to finish because mm -hmm. kids, kids finish high school and it can but it can also be an issue of can you is the pie big enough to support that? And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. If the pie is big enough to support it, and one of the parties wants to stay in the house for the kids, the continuity, those kinds of things, then great. That's a, that's I mean, absolutely a, an option. But sometimes that's just not possible. It seems the worst case scenario, which I've seen with some people, is they they negative equity, no assets to do it, they can't do a short sign, they're stuck with it. And and. It's the same as if you weren't get the the options there, and the and the and the trauma there, and the stress there is no different than if you were married and in the same situation. Um, we've had people walk away from houses for the same reason, the same as they might have if they were still married and found themselves in that situation. I don't necessarily advocate that, but it is certainly on the list of possible options of dealing with a house that's underwater. Oh, bankruptcy. You see any? You see any kind of really bad people filing for bankruptcy at that point? I have not no? seen that necessarily. I, I, certainly, we've been in situations where the pie is is very tight, and we have to go through that process of making sure that both parties understand what that's going to mean. And does that mean that uh, perhaps the party that is not the primary custodian of the children needs to share housing in some way? Does it mean there need to be adjustments in uh, some of the kids' activities. I mean, some of these things, unfortunately, are issues you have to discuss, and there aren't things that people want to do, uh, but it's just a fact of the situation. I had a couple, I think, an interesting solution. I only seen them do it once, and they said, we're going to continue to hold on to the house 
until the value is there's no longer it's no longer underwater. Then we'll sell it. And but they could have a long wait. I mean, I think it could be a long wait. Fairly optimistic uh, on doing that one, but the houses. And as I said, I, when, I've done some cases over the years where we would, people would take back, you know, the wife would get the house, they would get a second mortgage, private mortgage between the two of them. Right. And I've realized now in a lot of these cases where the people go to sell the house, and <laughs> it may not be totally underwater, but right. the wife is going to get nothing and pay off right. the, the husband, which I think they're going to be too happy about. And do about. you really want to be in a situation where you have a mortgage between two people that have been divorced? I, it, it just... It's just fraught with peril. I, I, that was a, something that common that we did for I did you know in earlier on, but you know um, because I, only because I think we wanted one person own the house. I, I've never been crazy about joint ownership Absolutely. because you know the roof goes. What's a exactly. repair? What's not a repair? You know, and doing that one. So it was a clean deal. It would work out. And when the house market prices were rising, it was a, you know which the, they did. F- for most of my legal career, well, it and then of course well. you would get an, a, a roof is one thing. That's a repair; it should be done. But you get issues of degree about cosmetics, Absolutely. and taste, and all those kinds of things, and, and so it can be tricky. The kids' activities. Uh, this is Tucson. Um, you know, a, a kid that has a horse or is taking riding that's a that's a that's a great one. It's a very expensive thing, and sometimes uh, the parents will say, "Well, we don't want to." We don't want to have this impact our child. We want them to continue to do whatever it is, whether it's the horse or some other very expensive activity, and you just have to sit down and say, that's fine. If that's really what you two want to do, that's fine, but you may have to look at these other areas, and that's what the implications are going to be. Talking about children, how could a financial planner help a couple who's getting divorced with child support? Child support is, there are child support guidelines. and uh, that is about the only thing for which there are guidelines. And so what we do often is really deal with uh, and, and create illustrations and examples. There's, a, by the way, a law in the last legislative session, I think, which was talking about alimony guidelines and factors and things like that, which I don't think it made it through. It didn't but, go very far, no. Uh, but we will also talk about the, the combinations of, of spousal maintenance and child support and because there are some tax differences. And, and what those, uh, tweaking those amounts in various ways, what that means to each party as far as their taxes are concerned. elaborate a little bit on the sure. different tax differences between child support and, and very alimony? Si- very simply put, uh, child support is, is, has no tax implications whatsoever. Uh, one person pays it, one person receives it. There's no reporting on taxes. It's not taxable income. It doesn't show up on taxes at all. Totally neutral. Totally neutral. Spousal maintenance is a tax deduction for the payer and it's taxable income to the recipient. So what is, is pretty common is if you have one of the couple is the, is the significantly higher earner, if they're paying spousal maintenance, they're able to deduct it from their taxes. At a higher rate. At a higher rate. It's taxable income to the recipient at a lower rate. Combined, they're actually saving money. So it, it, that is one way of perhaps on the margin, making the pie a little bit bigger. Well, that was one of my one of the lines I used to tell couples in there to a wife. I said, "You never thought of yourself as a tax shelter, yeah, but exactly, you are. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That so so that, that's that's one. Are technique. there other things with child support that uh, you, the financial planner, can help them with? Um, not necessarily. Again, because it's it's a public policy issue. Uh, the, the public has an interest in seeing the children are taken care of. So there's not a lot of you can't have all spousal maintenance if there are children. There has to be an element of child support. Um, and, the, and on the other hand, the child support can't be a massive amount of money if clearly part of it is, is should be spousal maintenance. So there there is some wiggle room there, but it can't be an extreme one way or the other. Okay. Um, clearly, once again, I, we're facing all sorts of interesting new issues in divorce cases for those of us who have done it for a long period of time. And I started out before there was, you know, no fault. Um, but what about, uh, I, or sorry, let me just add a little bit more on spousal. Is there anything sure. else that you want to add on spousal maintenance that a financial planner can help with other than? Well, well one of the issues is uh, whether it's modify or modifiable or non-modifiable and under what circumstances. In other words, uh, can that spousal maintenance be changed? Is, is, is the circumstances under which it can be changed part of the agreement? Or is it non-modifiable? The payer is going to pay it for that period of time, regardless of what happens. Is that a financial planning issue? I'm trying to think in it, terms it of it can be because what would be the rationale for going one way or the other? Uh, it, 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 that's where you get into a combination of the available income and the assets. So let's say, for example, whoever is going to be the payer, the spousal maintenance is concerned that they may be facing a re- reduction in income, reduction in salary, loss of a job. 
whatever the case may be, if there are plenty of assets there that they can continue to make those payments, maybe they're just not paying it out of income now, but they're paying it based on some other assets that they have, you may want to make it non-modifiable. Uh, as opposed to someone who has very little assets and is really income rich perhaps, or salary rich, but doesn't have a lot of other assets, then you really have to look at how sustainable might this spousal maintenance be, uh, what are the circumstances that they're generating that income, and, and uh, how might that change. Do you do much lump sum? I'm, I'm trying to think. I haven't seen much lump sum alimony lately. No, I've never done a lump sum alimony. It is, it's out there, but you do that one. Um, we've got about a, about a little about a minute left, actually. So uh, what we'll happens when the parties are unemployed? How does um, the... Or Th- th- then that becomes the question, and that sort of gets to the question of, I think my spouse should be working and should be earning a certain salary and so forth. And, and, and obviously that becomes a more difficult conversation in this economy. When, uh, but but you're saying that you think there's a difference between somebody who's unemployed and, and people who are dodging or not working? Uh, and I don't think people, I, I haven't had too many situations where I think people are, were legitimately dodging. They, they perhaps weren't making... The, the degree of effort that their, their, their spouse thought they should be. And so uh, that's sometimes part of the discussion, and that's where the way spousal maintenance is structured can uh, come into play as well. A certain period of time where there's an expectation that you would try to find employment. Um, you wouldn't get involved whether the person was employable or not employable at all. No, there are, there are services that will do that. They'll do an employment uh, review. And, and, and essentially express an opinion as to what the market might be for a particular person with a particular set of skills. Okay, we're just running out of time, about 30 seconds, 27 seconds left. Dave, it's been a pleasure having you as a guest. Any Thanks. other parting words that you have for, for us? And we'll, we'll be in flash. I use it on the screen you, your credits and where to get to. I, sure. We've got some golf conversation. I've been watching it myself, but it's, people need to get in touch with you. You'll, it's on the show Wonderful. on the screen and do that towards That's the great. end. But any... Uh, in eight, five seconds or less? Five seconds. <laughs> I, d- divorce is always a difficult process, but there are ways to make it perhaps a little less difficult. Good. You should think about that. Good way to end it. I like that. Thank, Thank you very much for being a guest. Well. Interesting copy. We have more. Yeah.